Welcome to the Tribe Talk Championship Preview, where uh, we look ahead to the, the, the start of the Leinster Championship this weekend as Galway get their campaign underway against Dublin Open Croke Park. Um, I suppose a uh, venue change in the last couple of days from Omar Park up to Croke Park, where we're going to have 8,000 fans up in attendance. Um, so that's something to look forward to anyhow, and great, great to be have, having the Championship campaign getting underway. Um, no, Dave with me this week. He's 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 on a bit of this week. So in his absence, we have another hurling guru joining us in Michael Verney from the from the Irish Independent. Michael, great to have you on. Thanks for coming on. No bother, Paddy. Just I'm a poor man's replacement for David now, but I'll do I'll do my best. You boys would have a bit more intimate knowledge of Galway hurling than I would, but uh, I'll I'll do my best anyway. Well, that's that was kind of the interesting thing. I was thinking when I when I was getting you on because you know obviously on, on all our podcasts. We'd have myself, Dave, and then we'd have call I guess, a lot of the time. So it'd be interesting, interesting to get an outside perspective and you know, an, an, an opinion on yourself and how you think Galway have been getting on during the league and how they're how they're fixed head, heading into championship. Um, you know, so I guess I think I think what Dublin really actually proved last weekend, you know, was that league is league and championship is the step up is there all the time, even though you only have your couple of week gap between the, the end of one and the start of the other. Um, so I guess. We're probably looking at. I think you're probably looking at how it gets going this weekend because it was a flat enough start last weekend in both codes really, hurling and football. A lot of trimmings either side, and even even the I suppose the game people would have been looking forward to the weekend most. Clare and Water didn't really live up to the hype either. And um, Clare were a four point hammering as I've seen a dub in some quarters. And um, so I guess we'd be hoping that the championship kind of really kicks off this weekend, especially on Saturday now with the, the two Leinster semis and the Munster semi final that, that evening as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Just something you said there. There was definitely a, a switch flicked with Clare anyway from league to championship, and there was a clear step up. And um, probably the same at Wexford and the same at Dublin as well. So even though it's been a short gap between league and championship, like the things definitely up the notch with those teams anyway. And then you look at Waterford and like if anything, they probably regressed from the end of the league. They finished the league with a flourish against Tip and probably went back a bit. Looked so flat for a championship game. And I suppose that's the challenge for for Galway coming in this weekend. Uh, any chance of complacency? I was kind of just thinking about this. Any chance of complacency and taking Dublin for granted is gone out the window after last weekend, which is a positive you'd imagine for Galway as well. They should be forewarned after the 2019 game and even just looking at Dublin the other day and how they were moving, uh, you know, any chance of, you know, not being up in top gear, you'd imagine would be blown out of the water because they should know uh, from past experiences that if they're not up to the levels that they need to be, uh, Dublin can take advantage. So I think that's probably a positive for, uh, I think that's probably a positive for nearly Galway coming in this weekend. And even if you look at it a week ago, we were looking at two potential Leinster semi-finals and maybe we weren't that excited about them. And then the performance of Wexford last weekend and the performance of Dublin last weekend, you're thinking you could have two really competitive semi-finals this weekend. And great that, great that they're up in Crow Park. Listen, you, me and probably everybody else probably thinks there should be double or treble what's going to be there at the game. But listen, it's it's a substantial progress get based on what we've had so far. So yeah, no, it should be two Ryko games this weekend. And the, there was a championship field to, we'll say, Clare last weekend. Um, Waterford obviously didn't bring that, but you'd expect even more of a championship field to it this weekend. A bit more kind of in-your-face stuff, stuff you associate with championship hurling. You, you don't get a handy puck in championship. You know that. You've played you've played club challenge games and club league games where you know you might you might think everything is going well. You go out in championship then. Well, I definitely have anyway, and it's just... You're hit, you're hit five times before before the ball is nearly thrown in and you're out of breath and things like that. So you'd be expecting that kind of championship intensity this weekend as well. You would, absolutely. And uh, I, I did an interview with, with Conor Cooney last weekend and brought up the whole topic of, you know, the scoring and uh, as a forward, as he feel the game has kind of changed a bit. And take was, his take was interesting in that, you know, he felt that the rule changes kind of played a part in the early stage of the leagues um, in that... He felt that defenders probably were standing off a small bit. Um, as a forward, he said he, he doesn't think the game has really changed. Um, obviously, more of a, 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 an emphasis on possession and that. But, you know, fundamentally, the game hasn't changed. But he thinks now that when championship has come around, you know, players have adjusted now to, to the, the new rules as well. And again, it's become less of a talking point in the, in the last couple of weeks. You know, that there's no one. After after the settled bedding in period for a week or two, it's kind of been accepted and it's been there's no there hasn't really been controversy around it. Um so like that, you know, as you say then as well, going from league to championship, that step up is there. Um, you know, the intensity levels are going to rise and it all should lead to 
more competitive games and better cases of, of defending and overall just a better spectacle to watch really, especially now when you're having teams of the quality of, you know, the four Leinster teams this weekend going at it, hammer and tongs and, you know, the prize and offer to get to a Leinster final and try to shorten the road to, to, to the All-Ireland, it's, it's worth a lot really, like, isn't it? Yeah, and call, call a spade a spade, there was, there was nothing on the line in the league. It was the most inconsequential league of all time. Like Galway and it's in Galway and the other really uh, top teams in, in that Division 1 Group A had no fear of relegation. Like Westmead were going to be the relegate the team that was in the relegation trouble there. So there were, you know, at times there were glorified exhibition games. There was no pressure on. And now you turn that to this weekend, there's there's always pressure on in championship. Like Galway want to go through the front door. They want four games to win in All Ireland. No messing. And I'm sure everybody, everybody wants that because nobody wants to go through the back door. So all of a sudden pressure is ramped up. There's people there and people add pressure as well. You, you know, and I, I do think something, what Conor Cooney said there is interesting. I do think it's becoming more of a forwards game. The poor, mm. the poor old back, it, it's getting harder and harder for him. Be it, be it tackling everything, uh, the, the sim being everything, it is much, much harder for a defender. But I do think the pressure will be ramped up this weekend. Just the noise of people in there. If you hit, if you hit a wide, all of a sudden, there will be 8,000 people, you know, caving in on top of you. There will be that pressure maybe that there wasn't before. So it will definitely, last year's Winter Championship didn't really re- resemble a championship in many ways, particularly regarding atmosphere. It definitely will be more of a championship feel to it this weekend. And like, I don't know about you, but, but I like mistakes. I don't like the ball going over the bar the whole time. You like to see wides. That's only natural. <laughs> I'd be a big snooker fan. And like anytime I watch a snooker match, I want to see misses. I think it increases the drama. Mistakes increase the drama as well. It's great to see, you know, exhibitions of scoring and everything. But people coming in increases the pressure, increases the drama. And I think we'll have more of that in this year's championship. And hopefully by the end of it, we could have, you know, 20 or 25,000 at an All Ireland final, and it will have more of a feel to more of a kind of a natural feel. But yeah, I definitely, uh, definitely expecting, you know, you know, a couple of two big clashes in Leinster this weekend. Yeah, and I think it's a good point to raise because, you know, even I, you, you talk about the snooker there, and golf is the one that comes to my mind, and major golf, like, you know, the US Open there the last couple of weeks, where your you're, you're winning score is four or five under par. It's a not, it, it is a lot more entertaining and it kind of makes you nearly feel better, a bit better about yourself too when you yeah, see these, these 100%, top yeah. mistakes. And, and, they're and human, they're focus, human you know. because we all make yeah, mistakes exactly. and they look more human as well, yeah. And it's the same, it's the same in hurling, like, you know, because out, out in a club game, these lads all make mistakes. We all, we all make mistakes out in it. So you like to see a lad make an error or doing something stupid and you're like, you're, you know, like a, a telegraph strike would say where Ashford would have blocked him from here. Like, what, what, what are yeah. they thinking? Do you know that sort of way? Um, so yeah, that definitely, and that, that is going to ramp up, as you say, when, when the crowd starts to come back in because it does increase the pressure. It's not, it's not just a, a, a behind, behind closed doors challenge game like, like, you know, players will be so used to playing. Um, so it will be interesting to see does that dynamic kind of change a bit this weekend. Um, now, you could say 8,000 in Crow Park is still going to be a bit lot. It's the biggest crowd these lads will have played in, front of in well over a year, and um, possibly since 2019, really, because league matches wouldn't, wouldn't even have got that bigger crowd. So um, it's set up nicely. You probably have the four teams coming into it in good fettle. It kind of almost has a small bit of a feel to, to that last day of, of, of the Leinster Championship of 2019 to it, where you had the four teams going at it, and obviously it was a memorable day for the, for the wrong reasons for, for us unfortunately um up, up, up in Parnell Park and you know the, the the game up there finished about a minute or two er, earlier than uh, what it did in Wexford Park and we're there scrolling and refreshing Twitter and constantly trying trying to figure out how how how, how to finish up up there. Um but I guess it's kind of magic days like that is what, what you want to see and it's probably set up quite nicely in that regard now because you know prior to last weekend Really, as you say, you would have seen a Galway Kenny Leinster final is not a cert, but it's it, there's a, a high a high chance that that that's the way it's going to unfold. And um, but now both both Wexford and Dublin, as you say, have made huge hu- huge steps up, and I suppose shown that you know championship was what what it was all about for them all along. Um, and I suppose we just we just focus on Dublin and their performance last weekend. Like there was a genuine sense around the country heading into that game last week <clears throat> against Antrim. That you know, there was a chance of an upset here. Antrim obviously had, had had a fantastic league, finished ahead of Dublin in the league table, 
um, got beaten eight points when they, when they did meet in, in, in the league. But you know, Dublin's only two wins were against Antrim and Leash, lost to Wexford, Kilkenny and Clare. Um, so there's a feeling that these guys aren't going great. But then t- turn it on like they did last weekend and put up 331 against an Antrim team who would obviously be coming into it very confident. But they just couldn't take that step up from league to championship the way Dublin could probably. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure on, on Matty Kenny last weekend, I'd say. Like it's the, the three years, whether it's COVID or what, I don't know, but his three years in charge has definitely passed by very, very quickly. And I would say, I, I said it on, on the, the Our Game podcast the other day, I was saying, like I genuinely think that was Matty Kenny's biggest game probably since Kula played the replay at All-Ireland in, in 2018. There was a lot of pressure on that game. There was the potential of being, you know, one step closer to that trap door of being in a match where he could end up down the Joe McDonough um, and you, you thought you, you would have thought maybe it would have seeped in a small bit, but from the start, they, they looked like they had stepped up a couple of gears from from league, and Antrim looked like they'd either regressed or stayed at the same level. Um, and I think it was just just how how well Dublin were moving uh, with them without the ball. Um, their key players were all in form. Danny Sutcliffe was nearly back in the half back line a lot of the time. He was dictating things. Um, the pillar of their kind of their team would say. Alan Nolan's always solid in goals. O'Donnell was, you know, really strong at fullback again. Liam Rush w- was was good at centre back, but there's still there's still probably question marks over him. And in particular, it's going to be interesting to see uh, from a Galway point of view. Joe Canning probably played out around midfield in a, in a good few league games. Be interesting to see whether we, Galway have so many options of guys that they could put in in that centre forward slot th- to move around and try to disrupt Rush. Like you're just thinking, Canning, Cottle Mannion. Connor Whelan, Can Cannon could even end up out there. Connor Cooney could end up out there, but that's probably an area where they look to get a good bit of joy because Neil McMahon has kind of sat off Liam Rush very, very far out, and he ended up with six points. He obviously, you can't say that that was just Liam Rush's responsibility because other guys maybe should be picking him up if he's in different spots. But I definitely think Galway will look to exploit that. I think the venue changes is definitely a plus for Galway as well. Like if you look at. Uh, that was the the Parnell Park clash. Like I bet Parnell Park is like so claustrophobic. It's it's like radically smaller than Crow Park. And even if you look at Port Leash, uh, it was in Port Leash, obviously where Dublin beat Kilkenny in 2013. So like they've had a couple of their big wins in, in probably smaller, more provincial grounds. Generally in Crow Park, the, the best team will always win. It's not an equal. It's like a, a smaller provincial ground is more of an equalizer. Um, and I think the mobility that Galway have, Crow Park will definitely suit Galway probably a bit more than it will suit Dublin. And I think they have the likes of the likes of Canning in particular and Cottle Mannion and these guys that can float into space. I think they have the potential to do an awful lot of damage. But from Dublin's point of view, you couldn't have been much happier with, with last weekend. You know, did so many guys hurl them well, and all of a sudden they're going into a championship game full of confidence, uh, full of optimism. And even like unearthing the likes of Keen O'Sullivan, who we probably wouldn't have seen much of. I'm a big fan of Ronan Hayes at the edge of the square. I think he's a real kind of throwback forward. He, he kind of has it all in many ways. It, it's not as polished maybe as someone like Seamus Callanan, but he has a hand. He has an eye for goal. He's very good wrist. He's quick he's quick on the turn. Um, so there's lots of guys there that the Galway lads are going to have to keep an eye on. And it says it's important from a Dublin point of view that they're coming in full of confidence. And... If you look back, I think it's really interesting. If you look back at the 2019 game, that looked like a, you know, a big turning point, we'll say, for Dublin hurling. And then all of a sudden, two weeks later, their bubble is completely burst. burst. Now, two years later, like, I don't know, whether, I don't know how, many, how much longer Matty Kenny will be at the rain or at the helm in Dublin. But if they're to get a big result at the weekend, that just changes their season completely and changes their outlook completely. All of a sudden, they're in the Leinster final. Uh, they're co- going to be guaranteed an All-Ireland quarter-final place and potentially if they won an All-Ireland semi-final place. So there's a huge carrot for Dublin this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 I guess you, you talk about the pressure there and the pressure, it's off them really now. You know, they're, they're, head, they're heading into a game against Galway who are you know, widely regarded by pretty much everyone as the team most likely to beat Limerick if Limerick are to be beaten this year. Um, they did what they had to do last weekend. They were impressive in doing so. That was the banana skin for them. Now is kind of it's an opportunity. It's a free cut at at Galway at getting to a Leinster title. Um, now they'll obviously have pressure on themselves to go out and perform and whatnot. But in terms of from a, from an outside standpoint, pressure's off Dublin. They're a dangerous um animal this weekend. From my perspective, again, fully agree with you in terms of the switch to Crow Park. I think it's 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 brilliant for Galway. 
Um, you know, I definitely I, I was up at, in Parnell Park that, that that day two years ago, and you just felt like Dublin really choked the life out of Galway, and there they're you know playing in a compact ground like that where you have a big support behind you. They were getting raved up all the time. The likes of Crummy and these lads, you know how much they, they, they love a fist bump and that, like you know. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but they, that was a day where just they were on song and you know things didn't go perfectly for Galway with Conor Whedon going off injured and whatnot. But in ter- in general terms, there was no excuses. There was beaten by the better team on the day. Um, it was the end of the Mihal Dunham era and whatever. But it shows what the, what Dublin are capable of, and you know they're obviously. Definitely after last weekend, there'll be no complaints, <coughs> complacency from a Galway perspective. But that game being switched to Crow Park, it's definitely it gives Galway an opportunity to op- open it up a bit and get the Dublin lads <coughs> running around, as you say, try drag rush out of position. And um, we go through the possible lineups there in Hawaii and what Galway might look to do because it's kind of a four man sort of half hard is what is what we're seeing a lot of. Um, you know, on the likes of maybe an Evan Island in that floating role could cause a lot of problems for, for Liam Rush, I think, um, rather than, as you say, stick, st- sticking a big man on, on top of him, like, you know, and, and, and trying trying to go through him that way. Um, the options, but, Paddy, even when you talk about there, the options in Galway's attack, it just, it's frightening, it really is, because, like, how do you win, how do you win All-Irelands? You win All-Irelands with four or five guys that can do an awful lot of damage, and you just need two or three of them on farm on a given day. And, like, I didn't even mention Evan Island when you talk about Liam Rush. Uh, there's so many guys there that can do damage and step up on a given day. And I think Brian Kincannon's form throughout the league, like he's he's in hurler of the year form. Like if he carries that on, like I, I think he's a great bet for hurler of the year, an outside bet. He just seems to be, every game is like four points or two, two in nearly every game. He's so clinical and he's so elusive. He's kind of a, a bit of a throwback to a, an old style corner forward as well. There's not too many, like if you go down through a lot of different counties, there's not too many counties have those kind of players. Any, anymore, you'll say Limerick, Limerick have Aaron Galan and maybe Flanagan. You know, Galway have would say Brian Kincannon and maybe Connor Whelan when he's inside. I, Kilkenny don't have a player like that at the moment. Uh, mm. Tipperary probably have maybe Seamus Callan and, and maybe maybe a, a no, uh, John McGrath or Bubbles or someone like that. But there's and maybe Watford have Desi Hutchison, but there's not too many teams have those type of players. Watford have or Galway have such variety in what they can what they can throw at you. They have the elusiveness, then they have. The bulk of, we'll say, a Joseph Cooney or a Connor Cooney or a Joe Canning, and then the kind of fleet footedness of, and the bulk of a, of a Connor Whelan as well, who kind of merges yeah. the two of them. So there, there's so many areas that they can hurt, uh, hurt Dublin in. And the matchup's going to be really interesting. Like, you'd imagine O'Donnell will, will pick up Connor Whelan wherever he goes. He's, he's had a decent bit of luck with him uh, when he's picked him up in recent years. But saying that too, if I'm looking at it from a Galway point of view, I'd be looking to take O'Donnell away from the edge of the square. So if if Whelan, if he's earmarked for Whelan, maybe Whelan plays corner forward, maybe Whelan plays wing forward, and then all of a sudden there is a bit of a hole at the Dublin at the edge of the Dublin defence that somebody else can take advantage of. Yeah, the, the, that flexibility that Galway have is it's a huge asset because you know I'm talking to you right now as a fellow who obviously would follow it very closely, the Galway hurling and, and that, and I could tell you. I'd be confident enough in telling you the six forwards that are going to start from where any of them are actually going to play and what position they're going to play and wherever they do play, they're not going to stay there for the full, for the full hour. Like, you know, we've had, I mean, just just think of the Cork game, you know, Joe Scooney ended up inside inside the inside line where, you know, none of us would have, would have, would have potentially seen him going and score, scoring three points in there. And you can kind of spend time inside, wheel and spend time inside. Then, of course, you you Joe Canning inside against Wall from doing, doing damage as well. So that's yeah, I uh, it's unpredictability, isn't it? How do, you, how do you play? Yeah, it's unpredictability, and that's you can't plan for that unpredictability, and that's such an ace to have in your pack, isn't it? Yeah, and that that makes the conundrum for Matty Kenny all the greater in terms of you know. I don't, I don't actually know what's coming at me this weekend in terms of what's their inside line, who's on or going to be picking up. I'd be if I was Matty Kinney, I'd be very reluctant to take him away from the edge of the square. Um, and equally, if I was Shane O'Neill and he was following Conor Whelan out to wing forward or something forward, I'd be absolutely delighted to pump, pump the ball straight in, um, and see it, see what joy you can get out, get out of the boys inside there. And um, because we are probably going to be be playing with the two inside, kind of either side of the post. Um, again, who they're going to be? I think one of them will be either Kincan or Whelan, who will be with them. I don't know. I I I I think personally, I think Joe Kenny might have done enough against Watford in there to justify be, being in there. And equally, 
I can't I can't see in midfield. I think we've we just have too many options midfield without needing to bring Canning out out there. Um and now, you know, it probably it probably all depends on, on whether Nyland starts or not, I think. Um I expect I expect he will. And if he does start, he'll be out he'll be out around around the center of the channel as that kind of fourth fourth half forward, along with maybe the two Coonies and and Whelan and then maybe something like Concannon and, and, and Canning inside. Um but I mean the conundrums for, for Dublin to deal with and are you going to put designated man markers on some of these lads or are you going to just trust that they go out and, and hurl their position and if, if, if you, enough of them do that they'll have enough joy and, 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 and they'll get away with it but it's, 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 it's not an easy an, an easy problem to solve this week is it? No well there's so many you're going through the Galway forward line there and you're just thinking there's so many holes to fill and so many things will have to go right I think for, for the Dublin defence uh, in order to cut like if if two to three of those Galway forwards are on farm, I think Galway won't be beaten. It's going to be very hard. They might they might curve one or two of them, but it's going to be very hard to curve curve them all. And I just think there's an awful lot of questions there. Just even look like it'd be interesting to see like will they try and if O'Donnell does follow Whelan, will they try and get you know Paddy Smith, who's a smaller player, in around the edge of the square, maybe with a bit of a physical mis- mismatch with somebody else, uh, and. While, while him and Keno Callaghan are very good defenders, they're not unbelievably fast. So if they're yeah. isolated on a Brian Concannon or a Connor Whelan or something like that, Gallo will get an awful lot of joy. And I just think the wide open space of the Crow Park definitely is a big, big plus for Gallo. It just, it, it just means things are so much less condensed. And they're, they're, like Crow Park is just a, a mad kind of a place. I remember when we played Port in 08, and I remember, I remember Niall Hayes getting a ball at the sideline. And I remember thinking... He had 10 yards to run down the sideline, a channel. He just ran a straight line down the channel. And I, cu- I couldn't get near him. And I just remember thinking, if this was in any other ground in Ireland, you'd be able to push him out over the sideline. But it's just yeah. like, the, the it's just so big. It's so wide. And I think that will suit Galway even more. Just so much pace, just so much pace up front. Um, and I say, Dublin will be able to plug a few holes, but there's no way to be able to plug them all, particularly at the back there. And I, I think the, there's been a switch in Galway the, la- the latter rounds of the league in terms of the hunger and desire for goals. Not that they're necessarily going hunting goals, um, but when, when a chance presents them and they get a one-on-one inside, they are turning and having a cut now, whereas maybe they weren't as, as much as they should have done in the, in the last year or so. And I think the likes of having either a Concannon or a Whelan inside there, like I say, I think that, that, that's been key to that. Concannon is, his first touch is so sharp and he's so quick off the mark. He's always out a yard or two in front, and then the turn acceleration. He's getting past defenders at his ease, um, and then sticking the head down and, go, and going at it. And he's been the real key key forward for me for, for Galway during that league. The form he's brought to it, both in terms of what he's scoring himself and what he's creating for, for others. Um, so you know that's again, you know, you're thinking as you say, possibly a Paddy Smith inside, like Kenan's going to be beating him out of the ball, no question about it. And he's, if he's snapping that ball first time and you're a Paddy Smith and he, this lad's turned to come at you, there's not a lot you can do about it, really. Is there? Yeah, there's Fair. a fair chance of a few penalties or sin bins this weekend as well yeah. if Galway get to run at them. Hey, come here, a quick one. I'm not going to let you away with it. You said you think you thought you could name the Galway six forwards. Na- name them there because I'd be interested to see because we saw Sean Loftus and Tui at wing forward at different stages during the league. So shout to me what the six Galway forwards are, are going to be, not in any particular order. I'll give them in order. Even better again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll, have, I, I, I'll have just Cooney 10, Nyland 11, Connor Cooney 12, Connor Whelan 13, Joe Canning 14, and Brent Cannon 15. With Con Cannon and Canning inside, Whelan out centre forward, and Nyland floating around the place. That's what's, what, your, that's, what's your midfield then? Is your midfield David Burke and Cottle Mannion? Is that what you're thinking? The two the two spots I feel are, are open on, on, on the team are left cornerback and that number eight to go alongside Cottle Mannion. Um, you'd say Johnny Cohen probably has the great, the best body of work done in the league to to get that spot and has been dead solid and, and a good file for Mannion in terms of you know releasing him to to play that attack and sort of playmaker role. Um, now he obviously has, has had hamstring trouble. I expect he's going to be fine for the weekend, but he's missed he's missed a bit of the last couple of rounds of the league. Um, so and possibly has 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 had an interrupted preparation for this. So then you have the same problem with with David Burke. Um, the half the half hour the two of them played together himself, man against Limerick was exceptional, mm. but we didn't see it again after that. 
Um, so, you know, and equally, is David Burke, does he see him as a starting man, a kind of a 40, 50 minute man now, or does he see him as maybe a 25 minute man or half an hour man at the end of a game? He could have a big bearing on a game in either role. I mean, you saw he, he did he did a lot of good things when he came off the bench against Cork um, in, the, in Park Cueve a couple of weeks ago. So it's an interesting one. I think it's between those two. I think Loftus, I think Loftus did very well, against, particularly against Watford. But do I see him being a starter? I don't at the minute, anyhow. Um, and then as regards the left corner back spot, that's a real tricky one. I see Darren Morrissey being to, in, in right corner back, all right. And then you're probably, you're probably between Shane Cooney and Aidan Hart. Now, I know Hart picked up a bad concussion as well against um, against Watford when, of course, Garrow's back and already ploughed into him. I guess that's as good a reason as any to, to, you, to, to you be have an awful, You have an awful habit of running into your own fellas <laughs> when you look back at it. And it's, it's the, big, the big lead run into the small lad too, far too often as well. You know? yeah. But, James, well, pa- Paddy, when you say it there, the one thing, the one word that comes out of my head is options. Like, there's so many options yeah. there. And, like, everybody talks about the strength of, of Limerick's panel, but the only way you're going to beat them is to have an equally strong panel. And it does look like when you, if you think maybe that Loftus might be playing or potentially that Tui might be playing, then either Morrissey, Shane Cooney, there's there's loads of options there. You've you've three into two in the midfield. Only only three, only two of Cohen, David Burke, and Cottle Mannion are going to be able to start. So you have another guy coming in there. You haven't named Niall Burke, who had a good league at different stages yeah. as well. So there's like that's effectively what one goal with the All Ireland in seventeen was was Flynn coming in, was Niall Burke coming in as well. So they're going to need that, and it does look like they have it at the moment. And plus, I think it was kind of smart, um, maybe putting even Loftus at wing forward at different stages and putting Tui there at different stages. At least if that happens in a championship game, they have guys that can slip into those spots fairly seamless enough. And they have it's nice to have just a small bit of muscle memory to know that you, you can actually play that spot when needs be. So I think Shane O'Neill has gone quietly about his business. Um, and something as well I, thought, I think is interesting the Evan Island thing I think is interesting. Everyone's talking at the moment about whether Stephen Cluxton is coming back with Dublin. But seamlessly enough, Evan Comerford has got a nice body of work under him. And if he's if he plays this year, it's not really, it's not going to be any skin off his nose. He, he's played a good mm. bit of time now. Same with Nyland. Quietly enough, he played a good few league games last year, good few league games this year. Could make, a, I think it would be his first championship start, would it be, if he, if he started. Yeah. So like, all of a sudden, he's got a body of work. And I'm not saying he's the next Joe Canning or anything like that, because that'd be an awful thing to put on anyone. But he's more than likely the next free taker for Gala when Canning goes. And all of a sudden, he is a nice little body of work put up on behind the scenes. He's taken pressure freeze in the All-Ireland semi-final last year. And he's probably, he's getting closer, ready to step up. So I do think like the, the succession plan almost is has been tipping away nicely in the background there, because when Canning is such an influential player, and would leave such a void whenever he does go. So it's important that you're quietly and slowly building up someone to fill into that position or fill into that role somewhat anyway. Yeah, I think I think Shane O'Neill managed the league brilliantly in terms of his, his squad rotation. That, you know, it wasn't, you know, every, those players like St. Ireland and Jam Mannion, these sort of new fellas coming coming onto the scene, they all got plen- plenty of chances. Um, and equally, you know, if you played very well last week, it wasn't necessarily the case that you were going to play this week. That was the nature of it. Players understood that. Like chatting to Connor last week, Connor scored one five against Westmead. It wasn't in the squad a week later. Like you know, yeah. that was the nature of it, and players understood that, and they understood the need for it because it's definitely been successful. In in that, I do believe now we have genuinely tw- we'll, we'll have twenty six options on Saturday. We didn't even last year. We did we didn't have that. You know, there were three or four lads that weren't real options on the day. Um, and that's that's going to be needed. Um, you know, not looking at Nyland, if Nyland starts this weekend, it doesn't feel like he's a, a debutant, even exactly, though he is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Whereas you compare it to compare it to last year against Wexford, like you know, we had Aina Murphy starting, we had Finton Burke starting, and we had Shane Cooney starting. They, that felt like three lads being thrown in the deep end. Now, in fairness, the three of them swam all right; they were fine, but. You know, they didn't have that body of work done in the league, obviously due to COVID more so than anything. They had been starting to get get opportunities. But Nyland was kind of thrown into it a small bit last year here and there, brought on for a few minutes against Wexford, then brought on out of necessity against Limerick and did brilliantly. Um and now has got, got a lot of starting game time in, in, in the league and done very well in the in the role he's playing. And I think he's just he's a hugely intelligent turner because he's not obviously not the biggest in stature. Now he's bulked up a bit in the last six or eight months, which is brilliant to see. But he's cute. He he plays his own game. He knows 
how to get the best out of himself. He knows there's no point me standing beside Liam Rush here now and trying to win a ball. Like, you know, he's floating around, looking, looking for a handy option, being a runner off the shoulder. And his striking ability is just second to none. Like, he's, he's the best. Yeah, he, he definitely has the best left side in the county, anyhow. Um, that, but yeah, that, that's definitely a fact. Um, but he's a lad who's developed an awful lot in the last year or two. And yeah, as I say, it doesn't, you know, if he's starting at the weekend, it doesn't feel like a risk or a, you know, a, a fella that might struggle in it. Um, he's the I body marked him one time in a club game and I knew he was, the, like, I knew he's predominantly left sided. And I still, he got six of the best off the left side. I does not, I, I, I does not literally, I knew exactly what he was going to do every time. And there was nothing you could do. Once he had the ball, he's one of these players, kind of like Tony Kelly. Once he has the ball, it's nearly too late. If yeah. he has the ball, it's too late. You have to deny him the ball. But uh, that left side is sweet. He he doesn't miss. He can nearly raise the white flag once he once he has it in his hand and throws it up on the left. He can nearly raise the white flag already. Lethal, lethal is right, Jan. I guess so. Look at the look at the other end and interested to get your take on the the whole central axis of the Galway defence and Garage Mac at three and Dahi at six. Um, I guess from my perspective and you know when we when we chatting to David and that and we're we're talking about you know with James Kehill on as well as well a few a few weeks ago and we were talking about the the gains that Galway need to make to make up that those three or four points on Limerick from last year and, you know, the likes of a switch in Garage Mac and Dahi trying to release Dahi to be a more dominant presence possibly at six and then ho- trusting Garage to hold the four to three. If that were to work, that could give you certainly a, a couple of a percentage of a gain in terms of where Galway were at from last year. Now, having seen it during the league in a couple of games, first of all, I don't think Dahi was fully fully at it in, in the league. I expect to see a much better Dahi work this weekend. But I don't know, have I seen enough from either from a, 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 as, a, as a duo to say it's, it's it's worked well enough to actually go with it in Championship? Um, interested to get your, your thoughts on what, how, you, how you think that went in the last couple of rounds. Yeah, I'd be the same. And like, Dahi played centre-back in a game and then you're thinking he's going to play centre-back in the next game and he's back full-back in the next game. And it's it just, they've moved around quite a lot. Um, you mentioned it, that probably the, the one area that you would not be sure who's going to play is probably the left corner back spot. So to me, in my head then, that says that the full-back line is a little bit more vulnerable than the half-back line. And if it's a small bit vulnerable, I think you have to have Dottie Burke at three. I think I think you just have to. Um, he like fair enough. You want you want two of them realistically. You probably want them three and six or three and five. <laughs> but you, you can't have that. But I while he's not going to offer you that you know attacking presence because he does. He, he wants he, playing centre back. He's going to be really cute on the ball. He's going to drive forward. He's going to be hard to stop. But he's so solid at the edge of the square. He is so solid. Um. It, it mightn't, you know, people mightn't see a lot of it a lot of the time because it's not the glamorous stuff. But he just, he just, he's rarely in trouble at the edge of the square. He really is. Um, whereas you kind of think maybe teams look like that they can get at McInerney for pace a small bit if he if he is number three. Um, I, I think that I think that Ebor could be number three. Um, the half back line. Like they, they would love to have Dottie Burke at six and Parik Mannion one wing and Fintan Burke the other. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, and I don't know if anyone in Galway is certain where McInerney fits in in the pieces at the moment. Um, and we'll probably only know when we see the team sheet on Friday evening. But I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shocked if he if he wasn't starting. Yeah. Uh, and they jig things around, and maybe Parik Mannion potentially could sit in, could would sit in centre back, and if if Hart was fit, he could end up even out in the wing as well. I wouldn't be shocked, but I do think. I do think O'Neill will go with what he knows. He knows exactly what he will get from Dottie Burke at three. Uh, and so I, I think he'll leave him there. Like, who do you think plays six at the weekend? Yeah, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very interesting one because, you know, I guess, I guess a lot depends on whether O'Neill felt it was worth sticking with again after the league, after the league in terms of have, have they been playing three and six each, you know, in, in, in games since the train or whatever. Um, you know, I I think if we're going Dahi at three and Garage at six, we're still as we were last year. You're still left with the possibility of a Keen Lynch on Garage Mac dragging them all over the place. You know, even since seventeen, the role of centre back has changed Nothing, hugely. Yeah. Like you know, there's no such thing as a a Shawnee McMahon of a centre back anymore, where they're pumping ball down top of him and he's plucking it out of the out of the clouds and launching it in on top of the edge of the square. 
if they were playing the game like that, I'd be delighted with either Garage or Dahi at six. I could see the two of them being really dominant in that. But even you think you think the, the two the two games Dahi played at six against Waterford and Cork, like there wasn't a high ball hit hit down to him really. Like yeah, you know, yeah. that's just the way the way the game has gone. So you need an athlete at six now as well. Now Pollock Manion does offer you that, but equally, you know, everyone in the county is in agreement that his best position is five. You know, so it, there, there's a balancing act there, but equally, like I, if Garrett isn't three, I, I'd be, in, I don't actually see him starting the game. Um, I think it's just whatever about a three, <coughs> excuse me, at, in the half back line, you need to have that pace, that athleticism to keep up. Like you think of the athletes you're going to be faced against Limerick, the Hagertys, Morrissey's, Keen Lynch, just in that half hour line, you need to be able to keep, be keeping up with them and tracking them the whole way and that. I don't necessarily know is he, is, he, is he the man for that. Now, at playing at full back, I mean, he had trouble with Horgan early on against Cork. There's no shame in that. Yeah, in fairness. You know, he's probably the, the most consistent hurler in, in the country of the last decade, nearly. Definitely won't have, anyhow. But in general terms, I think he's had a good league campaign. I mean, you think think of Seamus Flanagan against Limerick, who had a fantastic league. Garage did a good job that day. Um, you know, so... He's definitely hurling better than he has been in the last year or two. Um, and, you know, I think there's a chance he'll go with Garrow's three, Dahi at six. And if not, if Dahi's at, at three, I don't think Garrow starts, as you say. Uh, uh, and possibly a, a heart to come to that back line or, or something like that, or, or an aging two or something. Um, but I again, think it's interesting, it's just Paddy, wanna... as well. I think, they could, I think they could switch depending on certain games. I think McInerney could start at three, and, or Burke could start at three, and McInerney may start somewhere else. But if... You know, if you're seeing a game where, uh, and you see it a lot now, where the full forward line has not been fed that much, and a lot of it has happened from out the field, I think that's a no-brainer then to, to bring Dottie Burke out to, to the half-back line where he can dominate under a puck-out or whatever. And he did that last year against Tip. I think he came out he came out with centre-back at different stages against Tip in the All-Ireland quarter-final last year um, when the situation allowed. So they can be moved around a small bit depending on how a game is going there. But if you're looking at a full-back line and you're thinking Dottie Burke is in there and they're essentially avoiding him and not hitting the ball in and he's not getting a chance to dominate, I think then you, you move him out. He's he's too um he's too strong and too influential in the game not to have him central to what's going on in the game. So he offers great flexibility there. Like there's been very very rarely in the last decade where you're looking at a lad that can play two, three, four, five, six, or seven, eight or nine probably as well realistically. Yeah. And he, at county level, and he's going to offer you so much. Uh, he offers you different things in each of those different positions. So yeah, like he's a. He, he really is a joy because like, he is one of those throwbacks as well. He's a throwback of a fullback too because he's just strong as a bull. Like, and you just you, w- you will not beat him for strength. And you mentioned there about, uh, and I know he's probably not going to end up there, but when you love to see him going toe-to-toe with Hegarty or going toe-to-toe with Morrissey, uh, I like uh, even seeing him going toe-to-toe with Flanagan, but I'd love to see him even out in the half-back line, just how he'd go against the Hegarty. I think, I think that would be... That would be a blockbuster kind of a showdown. It'd be a, an unbelievable one to look forward to. And you never know. It might be something we might see in an All Ireland final maybe later on in the year. I think that that line in the field this weekend is going to be huge in terms of our half back line against the double half forward line. You think of the Sutcliffs and the, and the Crummies and the impact that they have and the influence they have on, on that Dublin team. You know, especially Crummies up there as a bowler at this stage. You know, he was brought up out, out of necessity. He was a fantastic wing back for them. And um, if if we're if you're able to curb their influence with you know Finton <clears throat> breaking even with Crummy in the air and Mannion you know getting the better of Sutcliffe like that, you're you're going a long way to negating what Dublin are, are are going to bring at you because the like those sort of fellas and Donald Burke whether he plays centre forward or, or or inside, they're those lads are really key sort of playmakers and influences in in that Dublin team, aren't they? Oh, they are. They're massive, yeah. But they they won't be afforded like Danny Sutcliffe picked up ball in space on his own sixty five the other day. There is not yeah. a, not a chance in hell that uh, Whelan and other guys won't be. They'll be sitting out. Whoever's out in the half hour line will be, particularly as you mentioned, that bank of four that they often play in the half hour line. They will just not be space for Crummy or Sutcliffe or Donald Burke or any of these guys to pick up the sort of ball they did against Antrim. I just I just, I just can't see it. Uh, even though it's in Crow Park and we talked about how big it is, Galway will fill those zones and like they will they will basically want Alan Nolan to have to put the ball down on top of Sutcliffe for Sutcliffe to win it. And I think they'll really they'll fancy their chances of at least breaking even if that's the case. So I don't think they'll be letting Dublin have any of that loose ball that Antrim let them have at the weekend. Uh, interesting though, something that we haven't talked about. And 
you talked about like how different more guys have more experience this year. Um, I think a key to Galway potentially winning All Ireland this year is Murphy and goals. And I suppose the bad experiences from last year, the learning experiences that he'll bring to this year. Um, in fairness to him, he um, he's 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 ballsy. I give him that because he he kept he kept he kept going for those puckouts against Limerick that he yeah. knew that they had to go for. Like they were playing with a sweeper, they had to go for those. Um, they're not risky, but they're lower percentage puckouts. But if they, you know, if they if they work, they could have got a couple of scores out of them easily. A couple of them broke down. I always think it's a bit harsh on the goalkeeper if you know if the the person out the field miscontrols the ball, the goalie is almost blamed for it, or yeah. if it doesn't go straight to his hand. But you'd you'd imagine he's learned an awful lot, and I I think when when it gets to those situations in those big games where he's gonna have to put a puck out through the eye of a needle at a hundred yards he'll be even better placed to do it again. And even just a couple of things like the, the day against Westmead when he was caught kind of standing up and, and locked down. I, I just like They're all really good experiences to get. And in fairness to, to Shane O'Neill, he has put all his eggs into the Anna Murphy basket and he's going with him. And regardless of any mistake I think he's made, he has told him, I would imagine, we have full confidence in you. You're the future of, you know, the future number one for Galway and you're going to be there for as long as you like. So I think we'll probably see that uh, that fate being, um, how should we say, being repaid later on in the year. And I do think yeah. he'll have an awful lot more experience when the time comes in those big games where, as you said, the people are going to be caving in and all the pressure is going to be going on and everyone will be shouting for the puck out to be got away quick before it's uh, you know free out or whatever. And he'll be able to put it into those areas that he needs to put it into. But I think that's a huge sector as well. Yeah, it was, it was interesting when we had James Scale on there about a month ago. We spoke spoke about Ana because you know he's not he's not a fellow that's burst onto the scene in terms of uh, as, as a goalie in the county. Like you know, he's widely regarded as probably the best goalie for the last four or five years in Galway, and then got his chance last year. Um, you know, fantastic shot stopper, and probably hasn't really shown an awful lot of that yet. But he, he's a brilliant shot stopper. But you know, when we were speaking to James about him, because there's no better man to, to pass comments like. Um, he was saying he needs to he needs to relax a little, and he needs to sharpen up a little all at the same time. You know, it was the feel the feel I get off him is that he kind of he's playing like he's out in Tommy Larkins if, all the time. Like you know, you know the the clearances against West Mees, that would have been grand playing for Tommy Larkins in a, in, a, in a league game up up up, up in Balnakil, like you know. And um, but at that level, even in in league, you're going to get caught. You need to be just that that fraction quicker. Um, and like, as you say, he's learning those lessons at the right time. And now you'll be hoping they're, they're eradicated from his game now. Um, I mean, he was put in a difficult position in against Limerick last year in those puckouts. Like, people don't give him credit for an offer of the good ones, the very good ones he actually mm-hmm. hit. You know, he hit a lot of cracking puckouts last year. Um, but you're facing a different animal in Limerick. You know, a lot more, a lot more of those puckouts would have, he would have got away with them as well <coughs> against another team. But against that Limerick team, they were just setting traps and they were so quick off the mark and so sharp. And the pressure they were applying, like, you know, they're go away and going to face it off, get it off anyone else, bar Limerick. Um, but I guess for, for Dublin, is consistency still the still the problem with them? I mean, we we, we, we think back to Parnell Park and that fantastic performance against Galway, obviously, two years ago. And then to go out and get turned over by Leash a fortnight later, as you say. Do they still have that that issue in their game? I mean, like there's no there's going to be no Eamon Dillon as well the next day. He's he's a big loss for them. But I mean, they're coming in off the back of a, a good performance now, and will they they have had trouble in the past backing up these performances with another good one thereafter. So I guess that that is something that a challenge that they, that they're going to face themselves this weekend. Oh, 100 percent sure. Like if you look at the Kilkenny game last year, that was a, a pure game of two halves. Like they didn't show up in the first half and were absolutely obliterated. Then had a big second half, but like you can't afford to have a bad half in, in Championship Hurling now. And if, even during the league, there were there were bright spots, and then kind of even within games, their consistency can drift off. It drifted off probably against against Clare and even against Kilkenny to an extent too. So while they were very very good against Antrim, like front fronting up against they're going up three or four gears this weekend. Like there's no point in saying any different. They are, um, and I think for them. No, I, I'm not. I, I don't know. I don't think really. I don't honestly think realistically that they can win the game. But I think for them being consistent and being solid throughout the seventy minutes, and you know, 
keeping it as tight as they possibly can would would be a success. I, I genuinely cannot can't see them winning can't see them winning the game. I think way too many things have to go right for them to win a game. And if you look at like Galway aren't carrying any knocks into this weekend. That that, that not any really serious knocks that, yeah. that I that I'm aware of. They nearly have you know a full panel to pick from. Um so like yeah I, it, the consistency thing is just to deliver a performance over 70 minutes, 75 minutes, you can't really do much more than that. But they haven't done that in recent years. So I think that's probably the, the big challenge for them. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be interesting because, as you say, and as we talked about already, we don't actually know what they're going to go with set up. We have a fair idea personnel-wise what they're going to face. But, you know, if you're playing another team, there's a more of a set in terms of what, what you're going to actually come up against, who you're more than likely going to be marking. I mean, we talk about, we haven't really even discussed Cahill Man in a whole pile, but, you know, Throughout the league, he's been looked at as the best midfielder going, the best midfielder in the country. And then, you know, it plays a bit of game, a bit of the game against Walsh in the half hour line. It's not happening for him. Goes out to midfield, has a brilliant second half. Then a week later, down in Parky Cueve, he's probably he's getting beaten by Derek Fitzgibbon at midfield. Fitzgibbon's right, tallying up to three or four points. Mannion's not having a great influence of the game, hitting hitting wides. Then he switches to half hour line and he just turns the whole game around, scores yeah. one two. I mean. You know that this this is a lad who's been looked at as the best midfielder in the country, but he's going up and being winning a man of the match award from from the half hour line. Like you know, so again, it's that that flexibility. I mean, they just don't know what they're going to face, and you know, it's just it's not a great position to be in. No. Really, Sharon <laughs> Farrell always says, you know, he always says, you know, God, we have all the pieces of the jigsaw. It's just a matter of putting them all together, and even during a game. The pieces have to be moved around a bit, and all of a sudden, you you mentioned Carl Mannion there. He could be in trouble in a position, and then all of a sudden, he's moved to it, like moved centre forward or wing forward, and he changes the game. And I think that's such a a lot of teams would you know they would they would struggle to maybe make those changes or would be under pressure to make those changes during games. But it's it's not an issue. There's, it's like a movable feast there. They can move lads in and around different places. Okay, he's not going well at wing forward. Okay, we'll switch him into corner forward and we we'll bring someone out. Then all of a sudden, it throws a different challenge at. At the opposition, so like I just think there's so many guys can do can do good jobs in several different positions for Galway. If you look at Canning, like he might not start midfield, but at least they know, like uh, in a given game, if if it's the type of game where a lot of scores have been got from out the field, and there's you know he can move into that center center field area and roam around and get get scores. If it's a case where there's a lot of ball going into a full forward line, he could potentially go in full forward again. I know a lot of Galway people would probably be delighted to have seen him go in there against Waterford because. Like it's where he started. A lot of people would think it's it's where he should finish as well. It's just that unbelievable goal threat in or in around there, and uh, he might not be in there the whole time. But to hmm. have him in there at times and to have the option to move him in, it just like that's a completely different threat than we'll say Quillen and Concanon. If all of a sudden Canning is in the edge of the square, you can leave the odd high ball in like you would into even into Johnny Glynn when he was there. It just changes the focus again. Then you have a, maybe a smaller, more diminutive, diminutive player hovering around him. And I think it's interesting from Canning's point of view. Like, I'd I'd love to I'd love to know what you think. Like, will he get the fourteen points this weekend? That's necessary to overhaul Henry Shefflin as the, the highest scorer of all time. And I think he's twenty seven four uh, four seven one at the moment. Fight that's five hundred fifty two points in sixty championship games. Shefflin has uh, twenty seven four eight four, which is five six five in seventy one games. So in eleven less games. He's right up on top of him. Um, yeah. you, you do, you'd, be a, uh, you'd be a brave man to bet against him getting uh, mm. not breaking it this weekend. I put it that way. Yeah, yeah. And I, we 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 just chat about it last, kind of when I was chatting to David a bit, a bit last week about the the whole free taking thing, and we haven't actually Nyland and Kenny haven't actually started a game together during the league and whatnot. And, you know, Nyland is arguably maybe even slightly better free taker than Kenny, but still. If the two of them are there, there's only going to be one man on them more than likely, yeah. and, and it's going to be Kenny. Um, but yeah, 14 points, very doable, especially if, if, he's, if he's in the edge of the square and he sneaks the goal. Yeah, he's well, well capable of it. And I suppose the fact that it's open Crow Park as well, it's going to lend itself to more scores. There's definitely a fair chance he'd, he'd, he'd do it all right. Would I be um, right in saying his last championship goal was that All Ireland quarter final against Clare in 17? Am I, am I right in saying that? That's the last one from play, yeah. Yeah, like that's a long time for a player like that, a player who has that goal threat. Like I just think it's a it's a great option to have, and I do think it's something that they'll utilize, even if he's in there for ten minutes before half time in a game or something like that, just to throw something different at 
at uh, at the opposition. Like without being smart, you'd be, you'd be bricking it if you seen him coming in to full forward for ten minutes because you know he could sna- he could snap a ball and anywhere around the twenty one, he's probably going to roof it. You know. Exactly. Yeah, it's a great. And again, the reason he hasn't scored the goal for play because of the change in role, like you know, and moving out to becoming that sort of playmaking role and scoring from distance, like in in, in at centre forward, like you know, as he did for a couple of years, and now that after another couple of blows to the body, maybe that that inside role is better suited to him, um, and having a sort of fellow off him that's going that's going to be able to run around him and, and work off him for breaks and that, and you can be a bit more direct playing ball into Canning. But equally, again, he still showed, you know, that that point he got against Water where he, he front he actually beat him out to a ball and he flicked it off him and robbed him and then turned him and stuck it over. Like, you know, he's still <laughs> the class is still there now and it's, it's not going anywhere. But I think I think there's a lot of God of people intrigued and would like to see him at the edge of the square. And you know, he, he was he was never moved out of there because he had started to struggle and he wasn't having the the influence that he had previously. He was brought out because it was felt he could be of more benefit to the team. Playing this other role, hurling changed, Paddy, no. though, didn't it? Like hurling changed, yeah. and and he, his role had to change as a result. Teams knew that they could sit a sweeper back in front of him, and the full back could spoil him. Whereas it's not really like that now. You can do more damage. I always say now, like if you look at Dermot Ryan from Clare, he went back wing back, and he'd probably score as much from wing back as he would when he played wing forward. That's kind of the way hurling has gone. And you look at the damage Canning has done from out the pitch, and the way he's been able to orchestrate and conduct everything from out there he's such a good player to set other people up as well he's a real mm. selfless player too in fairness he's, the, he's one of the best playmakers Hurling has probably ever seen uh, it used to be David Burke kind of playmaking for him and now all of a sudden Canning is playmaking for everybody else yeah and he, he, you know in, in the early days he was always always looked at him as kind of as a ball winner and a a, a target as such you know just pump the ball in and tap him yeah, like even if he went into the edge of the square this weekend, I would, I still wouldn't look at him in the same mold as that in terms of just launch a ball in top of him like they would run even when he was marking the rock thirteen years ago. Like you know, he's not that sort of player anymore either. He probably needs a more favourable sort of ball rather than a big fifty-fifty like that. And as well, defenders have just gotten better at deal at dealing with that too. You know, the, the physicality they've all developed. They're all bigger and stronger, and you know the the techniques of actually winning breaking that ball down and having the Plays around to, to win a breaking ball. That's all developed, you know. Again, it's just part of the way the, the game has evolved. But I mean, it, it, it's going to be an interesting one to to see as regards, you know, the team selection when it comes out probably Thursday night. You know, there, there probably won't be any, any major surprises in that. But how they line up and how they shape up during the game and at the start of the game, Saturday, that's where the real intrigue is going to be for me. Anyhow, so um, yeah, I guess looking looking forward to it and um, be great, 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 a great start to the championship. Um, great days, Harlan. Jesus, I can't, I can't, I can't wait for it. Um, we're, we're, we're junior, junior B county final on, on the Sunday. So, this is great. We'll be able to enjoy, enjoy all the hurling on, on, the, on the Saturday and then have a, have a good blow on Sunday evening. Then, but, um, fact, yeah. hard bet, just, hard bet, um, a good junior B county final. Like, as I was saying to you off air beforehand, that's the real heart of the GA. You know, like if you're looking for an hour of solid entertainment. Junior A, Junior B, Junior C, hurling or football, you know exactly what you're what you're going to get. Um, yeah, it's just it they're different games. They're so uh, they're so raw and genuine almost, devoid of tactics generally, and they're just so entertaining. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, the entertainment from the crowd is, is often is often better than what, than what actually happens on the field. So, <laughs> so there'll, there'll be a couple of hundred making plenty of nights in, in, in Kenny Farrick Sunday afternoon, no doubt. But um yeah, look, Mike, we'll, we'll finish up there. We'll, we'll wrap it up. I think we're both kind of both confident enough that we're, we're going to see a Galway win. Um, I think happy happy in terms of, you know, as you say, the, the performance of Dublin will have focused the mind, certainly from a Galway viewpoint. And then, of course, you don't need to think back too far to, to 2019 as well to, to know just what they're capable of. So, I mean, the reality is if Galway are, are going to be this team that are possibly there to dethrone Limerick, you need to be winning this and you need to be doing it in, in impressive fashion, don't you? Yeah, uh, I, I in my head, I'm kind of thinking, you know, anything between five and seven points probably would be, would be, that'd be something. I, and maybe to have, probably to have Dublin just at arm's length throughout the game, to have that four or five point gap, maybe the whole way through. That's kind of what I'd be expecting yeah. anyway. I, I don't see, don't see Dublin, uh, don't see Dublin threatening the Galway goal too much. I can't see them hitting, I can't see them hitting three goals against Galway. Um, yeah, just, just just can't can't really can't really see that. Um, 
Uh, if you're, like Galway could put up a massive score as they have throughout the league, and that maybe listen, maybe Dublin could put up a big score. And like we saw last weekend, uh, losing scores would would have won games ten years ago. Look at Leash's, it was one twenty one, and even what Antrim hit in twenty two points. But like Galway potentially could put up a you know a three twenty five or a three twenty six handy enough. So I expect them to have Dublin at arms end, and yeah, probably anything between five and seven at the end, I'd imagine. Okay, well, listen, Mike. Thank you very much for coming on. Great, great to have you on this week and get to, to get a, a different a different view and a non biased view. And, and we're going to go there at because try as we might, we're, we're all very biased in this show. So, uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll, we'll get you on again, no doubt, in a few weeks' time. And enjoy enjoy the weekend. I know a big weekend for the Ockley footballers. John Mahan is still working the Oracle down there, and another another tilt against Kildare come this weekend. So, confidence is high in, in the faithful county. Well, if you're biased towards Galway, I'm totally biased towards Offaly. There's a Leinster minor football final on, on Wednesday night. The minor hurlers are playing a Leinster final on, on Saturday. The hurlers are out Saturday against uh, against your near neighbours in Sligo. It's the first time they've ever met in Championship Hurling. And I hope it's the last time they'll ever meet in Championship <laughs> Hurling, if, if, if I'm honest. And then the senior footballers are playing Kildare on Sunday. And uh, and Shane Lowry, uh, our sponsor and a kind of great follower, is uh, involved in the Irish Open this weekend. So... These these couple of days are very big for everyone in Offaly. <laughs> go go and enjoy it anyhow, as, as they say. So uh, thanks, man, for, for joining me, Mike. And uh, no we'll have you on again in a few weeks, as they say. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. And uh, send us your feedback. And we'll be back next week with a review of Galway's Leinster semi-final victory over Dublin. So until <laughs> then, man. thanks, man. We'll chat. <laughs> chat to you soon. <laughs>